Shimano and Campagnolo are the two biggest brands in the land of cycling components, and while they have produced some brilliant products over the years, there have been a fair few failures too. Here are the absolute shockers. So first up, we're gonna look at the lovely looking Campagnolo Delta brakes. Nice. While looks are obviously important, what you really want your brakes to do is stop you. And it was here that the Campags engineering had gone too far towards the looks. Oh really? Mm. Oh, well, on paper, the idea was good. A center pull brake with the mechanism hidden from the world by an aluminum cover. The Delta was part of perhaps the best looking Campagnolo group set ever made, 1986 C record, and the brakes were the jewel in the group set's crown, with meticulous polishing in places where no one would ever look. <laughs> the first version was recalled because, well, depending on who you believe, the pads could fail from overheating on long descents, or the cable clamp could fail. Neither of those are no. what you want to happen. <laughs> no because they left you with no braking at all. Yeah, not a good situation. Uh, subsequent versions solved that problem, but still didn't stop mechanics complaining that the deltas were hard to work on. The cable had to be long enough to reach the clamp, but no longer, as there was nowhere for the excess cable to go. Mm, not ideal. The cable clamp used a 3.5 mil hex key, a size you won't find in many off the peg tool sets. Campagnolo did include one with the brake, but if you lost it, then a replacement was really hard to find, especially in 1980s America, where imperial units still reigned supreme. The later incarnations did use a 4 mil hex bolt instead, so. Well. Some, some improvement. Mm. Um, this didn't solve what engineers saw as the brake's fundamental flaw, <laughs> that the mechanism inherently provided inconsistent braking power, and as the pads wore, you could end up with no braking at all. Yeah, that's, that's rubbish. All of those things sound really bad. Yeah, they were also the heaviest brakes Campagnolo ever made at 480 Oof. grams for the pair. And for comparison, a pair of 1981 super record brakes weighed 334 grams per pair, so you had to really like the looks. Yeah. Moving on, Shimano's BioPace chainrings were terrible, apparently. Uh, <laughs> they had been invented and then scrapped before I or Jamie were even born. And honestly, I'm happy that the first time I'd heard about them was when I was doing research for this video. Yes, when Shimano launched this ill-fated mid-1980s attempt at popularizing electrical chainrings, it released a paper on the idea. In summary, yeah. the paper said, sensible argument, sensible argument, sensible argument, Huge assumption, sensible <laughs> argument, sensible <laughs> argument. Yeah, the huge assumption was about the orientation of the long axis of ellipse, which Shimano decided should be roughly 90 degrees. So the orientation of every elliptical chain ring before or since. Now, uh, Jamie, I don't understand what that means. Could it, you it doesn't us? sound clever, does no. it? <laughs> anyway, this effectively meant that the gear dropped through the power stroke, which felt weird, but you could get used to it, apparently. Okay. However, there were reports that for some riders it caused knee problems, not good, not and bad. Shimano's target users, mountain bikers, were looking for ever lower gears, and Biopace's limitation of a 28 tooth inner ring was a pretty serious flaw. There was never any evidence that Biopace was more or less efficient than round rings, and in the early 90s, Shimano quietly dropped it. The company had moved its attention to better gear shifting and had come up with chain rings that incorporated shaped teeth mm. and ramps, like its <laughs> Hyperglide rear sprockets. Mm. These didn't work with Biopace, which gave Shimano a face-saving weight to drop it, though by this point, riders had switched back to round rings anyway. Yeah. While we're down at the chainset area, why don't you cast your minds back to when Campagnolo decided to make a bottom bracket out of titanium? Oh, yeah. yes. There was actually reasonable thought behind this. Replacing okay. steel with titanium has long been a popular way for bike component makers mm -hmm. to save weight. There are plenty of subcomponents where this works really quite well cable clamp bolt, adjusting screws, even long rear derailleur mounting bolts are loaded lightly enough that it doesn't matter that the titanium part isn't as strong as the steel part that it replaces. I love a bit of titanium. We do love a bit of yeah. titanium. Now, titanium does actually have a better strength to weight ratio than steel, but titanium is less dense. So to get an equally strong part, you need more of it. And if a component mm -hmm. can't be made bigger, then the titanium version will be weaker. Yes. Or less durable. So a bottom bracket axle can't <laughs> be made any bigger. 
Anyway, that was the problem with the super record titanium bottom bracket that Campagnolo introduced in the late 70s. When it failed, it failed at the square taper, leaving a bit <laughs> in the crank and a bit sticking out ah. of the bottom bracket bearings. Uh, in 1982, the Giro that year, race leader Fignon had a bad crash thanks to a broken mm. axle, sending Campag back to the drawing board. That's a bit of a marketing nightmare, really. Yes. Yeah. Well, but it lived on. Oh, Version no. 2 <laughs> solved the problem by holding the crank arm in place with a nut instead of a bolt. So there was no thread inside the axle to provide a weakening stress riser. I mean, thankfully, the whole issue was made moot by the development of splined hollow bottom bracket axles and then two-piece uh, cranks uh, with even larger axles. Progress. Yes. If you ask a new or even experienced cyclist what their biggest fear is, it will probably be coming to a stop and not being able to clip out of those fancy pedals. Yes, the result is often limited to <laughs> dented pride, uh, but our next idea was pretty much a golden ticket to a mid-ride tumble. While Look was creating and then dominating the road bike clipless pedal category, Shimano saw an opportunity in the booming mountain bike arena. Hmm. Instead of a big plastic cleat that stood proud on the sole, Shimano tucked a small steel cleat into a recess in the sole so that you could walk in the shoes. Sounds I mean, like a great idea. It was a runaway success, still is. Uh, first among mountain bikers and then touring cyclists and uh, commuting riders who liked the security of being clipped in but wanted to be able to walk um, off the bike. It's really quite handy. Yeah. Shimano made several attempts to crack the road bike clipless market with designs that included a single sided pedal that used the same two bolt cleat design as the mountain bike pedals. The tiny cleat didn't work for road cyclists who complained it allowed the shoe to rock on the pedal. There was even reports of powerful riders managing to twist the cleat out of the sole. You don't want that. You, you really don't. Really don't. Uh, Shimano's next attempt was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> the SVD R pedal had two bolts on the center line of the sole, so it required shoemakers to retool to accommodate it. Aside from Shimano, few did, so your <laughs> shoe options were severely mm. limited. It was hard to get out of the SBDR pedals, That's not making good. them the Hotel California of clipless pedals. <laughs> you could clip in, but you could never leave. <laughs> the cleat was still relatively small compared to a look cleat, so your shoe was still not stable on the pedal either. I mean, to be fair, one group of riders did love the SBDR. Did they? Track racers. Ah. Um, the difficulty of exit appealed to riders for whom <laughs> an accidental pedal release was a disaster. And over a decade after they were discontinued, they were still a cult item in the uh, track world. There we go, learn something new every day. Shimano eventually gave up trying to go its own way and produced the SPD SL in 2002. This fit the same three bolt mounting as look and has been a brilliant design ever since. And finally, a much more recent failure on Shimano's <laughs> part came, well, with the Holotech 2 crank sets. These are still out there. Mm. As the name suggests, these cranks were hollow inside with two alloy pieces being bonded together. The theory is sound, and to be fair to Shimano, many people have experienced zero issues. <laughs> but when they failed, they failed dramatically. If you ask Shimano, I'm pretty sure this isn't a problem. Yes. <laughs> But anyway, the issues seem to be caused by water ingress. It would work its way in through the hollow axle, get busy causing some corrosion in the bond structure, and that's when you'd find your crank set in two pieces. So you know that you said that Shimano said that it wasn't a problem. Mm. They've said that with the new 12-speed group sets, the issue has been resolved. So that problem that wasn't a problem has been resolved. Excellent. That's probably we'll... why they're slightly heavier. Yes, mm. but... The thing will be, time will tell whether they've actually solved the issue. I'm happy with a few extra grams and my crank not falling apart. Me too. <laughs> but none of us have ridden them through a winter yet we to haven't. really test them no. out. And I won't be. <laughs> you don't ride in the winter. Well, I do. It's just cold, so I ride a lot less. <laughs> and I don't ride my nice summer bike with the 12-speed. Anyway, um, which one of these is your favourite? Worst? Favourite? Yeah, favourite failure? Yeah, let us know in the comment section below. Oh, and remember to like and subscribe before you go. Because, you pesky lot, there's 80% of you that haven't subscribed to the channel. Naughty, so naughty. you're probably missing out on whatever brilliant content Liam thinks up next. Yes. <laughs>